Yeah, great. Thank you. So to get things kicked off, um, like like Faith mentioned, we would talk mostly about mapping and geospatial capabilities in the Elastic Stack. Um, if we move on to the next page, we didn't actually include Kent in that title page because it was a late breaking addition to the team. Um, yeah, I'll go back there, right? So here's us again. Uh, obviously, you're seeing our faces, but the, the pictures are nice too when we're at our best, maybe. <laughs> uh, so yeah, Thomas, principal software engineer. Uh, Kent is the principal product manager. I'm the manager of solution architecture. I don't know if we want to do any extended introductions, votes from Thomas or Kent. To, <laughs> if you have anything interesting to say, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's us. Uh, so we can move on. Um, let's talk quickly about who we are and what we do. Um, Elastic is a search company, and you'll hear us talk about this all the time. Um, we do all kinds of search. Uh, and a lot of people think about search. They think about searching for websites, searching for documents. Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that. Um, searching is how you find what's normal, uh, what's trending in the wrong direction, what's caused a failure as you're observing or monitoring your IT infrastructure. That's observability. Um, searching is how you find threats in your network or bad behavior among your users, and that's a security problem. And of course, searching is how you find websites and documents, and that's what really is encompassed in enterprise search. Um, and we have solutions for all those scenarios, and I encourage you to read more about those on our website. Um, but we're here to talk about geo, and if we click, you'll see that we think geospatial analysis is a search problem. That's really what we're going to focus on today. So I'm actually going to hand it over to Thomas to talk through some uh some of our use cases that customers have have explored. Um, so yeah, take it away, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, yeah, I just thought to highlight a couple of customers that are using um, our product suite as a search problem for geo in these big three buckets of search observability and security. Um, and, and one group of customers uses it to look for rides where, where end users can use their phone and look for a, for a, a ride in a ride sharing app or um, track their packages for logistics. Um, Uber is their a big example, but there's other companies who, who use um, the search capabilities in Elasticsearch basically and the geo search capabilities specifically um, um, to help them with their, with their use cases um, in, oops. Uh, in the security domain, the Nature Conservancy is another sort of company with a lot of um, geo data, uh, and they use it to secure the network. So they have uh, several stations across the country where they can um, basically use uh, our product suite and again the geo capabilities to enrich their uh, security data. Um, and then there's other companies who who are more in the IoT domain, sort of this Internet of Things, where they, they have a lot of sensors. Um, of moving assets um, that they keep track of. Um, Furuno, for example, is one that keeps track of their ships and TerraView keeps uh, track of their satellites um, in our product suite. And the geo capabilities there are always um, a front and center. And uh, back to you, Mike, if, uh, for demo. Yeah, before we even move on to the demo, I, can't, I don't wanna put you on the spot. I don't know if there's any other um, vignettes you have from some customers on <laughs> uh, that you that you talk with on how they're using us um, on the geo side, or even expand on any of those points that that Thomas covered. Yeah, I mean, thanks, Mike. I, I would call out a, a few uh, customers that I've spoken with recently. Um, I, I can't speak. Um, I can't actually name the customers, but you know, we have a, a lot of folks in uh, the sort of uh, defense contracting and um, uh, defense space that use the stack to take advantage of just sort of like the speed and scale in which you can search through large volumes of location data and make you know, these spatial proximity queries. Um, so we have lots of folks in that space. Um, Thomas mentioned uh, the last thing sort of around devices and assets. We have some companies that we work with uh, that are doing asset tracking um, and logistics type work. Uh, but we know there's a, a breadth of sort of exploration uh, happening with the stack um, and if there's anyone here on the call who wants to talk more about their use case, uh, just feel free to raise your hand or, or put a little note in the chat and we'll make sure to reach out. Uh, but yeah, Mike, if there's, if there's more detail there, we can maybe chat a little bit at the end of the, the session. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, I think a point to make is that we've been doing geodata in the Elastic Stack for a long time. It's back at 
it was something like dot 17 or maybe even earlier I, I had looked at it up on the up in the past uh, when Shai first added the ability to store points in an Elasticsearch and do geospatial searches. So we've been doing this kind of stuff for a long time and it's really been maturing since that humble beginning <laughs> into something uh, much more powerful. And if you haven't come across us lately on the geo side, um, you might be familiar with some of our more basic visualizations in Kibana. We used to be able to display um, just some level of aggregations and what we called a, a uh, coordinate map and we had a region map where you could do some kind of choropleth as it's called technically, some visualizations like that. Um, but for the most part, if you're doing geo in the Elastic Stack, you were using our APIs. It was all custom UI stuff. Um, and that's where Kent was talking about on the uh, on the defense side. Most of the users in the defense world were, were building their own apps, but were using Elasticsearch through APIs in a, in a very heavy way. That's where kind of all the heavy lifting was going on. Uh, in the past year or so, two months, two years, maybe year and a half, two years. Uh, we've been, we, we, we started doing a lot more on the UI side and that's where we came up with Elastic Maps, which is what I'll show you in a little bit. Um, so Elastic Maps is a multi-layered GIS application. Again, you'll see what it looks like. Uh, that really does expose a lot of the geospatial capability that was in Elasticsearch to a user without having to build your own stuff. And without having to build your own stuff is a good thing. We've been doing a lot of that work uh, in general, in the Elastic Stack, as we talked about the observ the observability and security and, and enterprise search solutions in the beginning, we call them solutions because they're things that work out of the box. So you don't have to spend much time building. Uh, and the more time we spend building, the less time you spend building, I think, is better for everybody. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen to show you this little demo. So you should be seeing a little layout here from a data flow side. And this is what we're, we're going to talk through. There's data out there on flights. Uh, you'll probably see us talk a lot about flight data and I need to maybe create a new geospatial demo, but for now it's it's very flight focused. Uh, we have all this data coming to us from the Open Sky Network. They have an API that gives you all this state information. I'll show you what that looks like again. Let's um, have Logstash running. That's pulling that data from that API every 15, 20 seconds or so. Uh, I do some machinations, load it into Elasticsearch. And it runs some enrichments. That's what that little curlback looks like. So we're, we're using Elasticsearch in a couple ways to not just process data, but to enrich data. And then finally, it goes, it's visible in Kibana in Maps. What I wanted to show you first was what this kind of looks like in the end, and then we'll walk back and show you how we got this done. But this is a dashboard in Kibana. Um, for those who haven't seen Kibana in a little while, you notice it looks a little bit different. Have these nifty headers they can search through in other ways and a little bit different layout on the menu side. Um, but a dashboard's a dashboard, and that's what we're looking at, a dashboard. And um, we have all these flights flying around. I have tracks for these flights. Uh, you notice it just updated because it's updating every 15 or every 10 seconds or so. I think it's updating every 15 seconds. Um, get some nice aggregate stats. So in this 15-minute window, I have 105,000 records, 7,000 unique flights. You can get some stats on maximum altitude and velocity. Here's my counts over time. So it's a dashboard that's combining my geospatial data along with uh, just other factors of that data. Again, counts and aggregate, aggregate statistics. Um, I also have another dashboard that gives me a, another level down. So not just where those flights are in a map, but more information about the aircraft and the operators themselves. So I can look at uh, who's flying these things. And this, this is actually over a longer period of time. This is a, a seven day window. So I'm seeing that, you know, Federal Express seems to fly a lot, <laughs> unsurprisingly, uh, with Delta and United kind of leading, following from, from them. And this is sorted by, by count. So as we go down, you'll see that, you know, Spirit Airlines is flying the least flights overall as compared to Federal Express that's flying the most. Um, from the manufacturer side, Boeing has the most flights in the air over the last seven days um, and, and on down. Um, we can even analyze it in other ways because now I'm looking at it from the airline and what, what kind of aircraft they are typically flying. So this is American Airlines, who's flying some Airbus and Boeing primarily. Uh, I thought interesting one here was Southwest. Southwest only flies Boeing aircraft. They fly nothing else. And they're the only uh, aircraft airline that is doing that. Here's United, who's mostly Boeing, you see, but they do have others. And for the most part, everybody flies a couple different planes. Now, on the other side of things, I can look at it from the manufacturer outward. So here's Boeing and who's, what airlines are, are, are sorry, this is from models. Um, looking at the airline and what models we're seeing. So the one of the number one, I don't want to filter, but I could filter. Well, one of the number one uh, models that's currently flying in the air today is this 738, the Boeing 738. And you can get a quick picture of that down to some of the smaller ones, a bunch of Cessnas, if you wanted to filter down on that, uh, which would be interesting just for fun. I mean, if we click on Embraer here and say, yeah, I want to filter on that piece, come back to me. 
Yeah, this is a bit of a zoom lag, I have to admit, when you click on something, there we go. So click on Embraer, it does filter down and we can see, um, interestingly, it's mostly flown here by other smaller regional operators and individuals. So I'm not sure who KLM City Hopper is, but well, KLM is a large airline, City Hopper must be a small regional outlay of theirs, but they fly a lot of Embraer's or so it seems. Um, okay, so that's, again, just kind of walking through some of the stuff we can do. I had some other visualizations here that we're looking at combining altitude and velocity. You know, you can get a sense of how high things are relative to how fast they're going. Um, unsurprisingly, most of the aircraft we see kind of live in this little zone. They start low and slow. They get kind of high and fast, flying mostly around 400 miles an hour and about 30,000 feet. Uh, but some other aircraft are flying a lot higher, potentially. <laughs> These are probably data problems, like this thing out here flying at 900 miles an hour. Uh, don't know if that's a real plane or not. It might be. Another one's looking at the aircraft types and velocities and aircraft types and their altitudes. Just there's a lot of interesting analysis you can do with some pretty basic charting uh, using Kibana and using dashboards. But how did we do this? So Open Sky Network um, gives you, I guess, like I said, an API to get a variety of different kinds of data. Um, what I ended up using was this endpoint called States All, which gives me a list of all these little beacons from all these little aircraft and you get some interesting but kind of basic information so with each each call to that api I get back a list of aircraft i get their unique identifier some call sign information uh the latitude and longitude which of course is super important and other little statistics like its altitude its velocity its current track its vertical rate um interestingly there's another piece here called squawk which is a, a transponder code. So if there's a, a hijacking, for example, there's a squawk code for hijacking, and that's a fun little thing to try to look for. Um, for what it's worth, if you do look at the data, I think there's just a lot of people testing their squawk codes because you'll see you see them show up a lot more than you'd expect. <laughs> you know, compared to what you hear in the news, there's a lot more data showing hijacking than there's actually news reporting hijacking. Don't ask me to explain that. All right, so I'm going to hit this API. I'm going to get this data. I'll show you what it looks like. So here's me at Open Sky Network states all, and this is what you get. You get a big array of states, and each state gives you that information we saw. Not you don't get to see what the variable name is, right? It's just a list of things. So we have to refer back to what we had and say, you know, position 17 is this position source. So I know that my very last record here is that is that value. Um, and that's not very easy for us to use. So when we when we ingest this data, we're going to want to name these things, right? We want to be able to name things. I want to take this ugly uh, epic second value and convert it into a date so it makes sense to me to read. And that's what I'm doing in Logstash. So I'll make this a little bigger. This is showing our Logstash pipeline that's dealing with this data. Here's my little input where I am pulling this URL, the open sky one I just talked about, every 15 seconds. And when I get a response, I'm going to split it because as we saw that states field has a list of different states and I want to create a different record for each one. And so it's pretty simple here. I just say, I want to split on states. And here I'm going to give things names. I know that very first in, that first record inside of states was that iCow number. If you remember, it's there's the very first one called, it's the iCow. So I'm just giving everything a name, um, doing a little bit of cleanup, stuff like this where I can translate a field and say, when I get the number zero, it's actually, it means this EDSB is the sensor. And OpenSky told us that it says, if it's zero, it's ADSB. And for whatever reason, they decided to convert something human readable to not human readable. So I've decided to convert it back into something human readable. Uh, other little cleanups, but then I put it into Elasticsearch. So here's where I'm defining my output. And the part that's the magic, if you will, is that I'm going to run it through a pipeline inside of Elasticsearch. And that's where I'm going to do some of that enrichment that you saw before. You know, Open Sky again doesn't give me much. I get the aircraft uh, unique identifier, but I know nothing else about it. I don't know that it's a Boeing aircraft. I don't know it's a 787. I don't know it's operated by American Airlines. None of that information is coming to me from Open Sky. So I'm going to have to do some work to enrich this data with that data. And that's what I'm telling Elasticsearch to do. I'm saying, Every time you get a record from here, run it past this pipeline, which I will show you what that looks like. So before I was able to build these enrichment pipelines, I had to get that data into Elasticsearch. So I did find a little aircraft database that I was able to put into Elasticsearch here. And that aircraft database looks kind of like this. There's a bunch of records that give you information that say, here's the, here's the engines for that aircraft. Here's that all important iCal number that gives me the thing I can join on. Uh, but this particular is built by Pilatus aircraft, whoever they are, <laughs> right? 
Uh, here's the model of that particular aircraft. Here's who owns it. And so I have 460,000 of these to start enriching that, that flight data with this aircraft information. And I also have information on airlines. Uh, this is interesting because the aircraft, if I could find a good example, if I go to aircraft, yeah, not airline. I think it was actually owner airline, manufacturer, owner. It was owner. Um, what I'm looking for is a record that shows that some of these aircraft information, they actually do tell you that it's American Airlines. Um, yeah, owner, I think it was under operator. You have to just trust me here for a second that the some of these records did have information on the operator, but it wasn't complete. So I might know that it's American Airlines, but it would only give me a part of that record, not the full record. And so with this, I can get the complete information. So if I go back down and find uh, American Airlines, you'll see that there's some other information. There's this call sign, I get its country, and I get these other little features. It's IATA code, it's ICAO code, and it's name. Um, and so in a lot of these records we're getting from Open Sky, you get only a part of this. I might only get this IATA number AA, but not know that it's called American Airlines. And of course, for those of us in the United States, some, you know, I know that AA is American Airlines, but there's a bunch of other uh, codes here that you don't know what they mean. So being able to enrich it to fully flesh out that record is valuable. So my ing ingestion pipeline then does those things. Step one, when data comes in from Open Sky, I add aircraft data using that iCal number. So I'm pulling in all those aircraft records, merging it with that new the incoming data and giving myself a more complete record. And I'm doing this airline data matching. You see there's three of these steps because they're not always populated on the uh, aircraft side, like I mentioned. So if it's if it's empty, I'll, you know, if the operator name's not empty, I'll use that. If the iCal's not empty, I'll use that, et cetera. So in the end, I get, again, a complete record for each incoming piece of, of open sky data, I have complete aircraft information, complete airline information. And then I do some pretty stuff just to make it easier for me. And again, in, in my American uh, nativity to, uh, to, to convert meters uh, to feet. So I'm just doing a little math quick to take a look at it is I'm getting meters in you know, barometer in, in meters. I'm multiplying it by this 3.28 number to get feet. And that just makes it so that uh, all this stuff is indexed and I can do a much quicker search on uh, on things that I understand on on meters per or, uh, miles per hour and uh, feet, et cetera. So in the end, this is what my flight data look like looking at raw records. I have these things coming in and uh, there's a lot more data now, right? I have aircraft information, like I said. Um, so this particular one is this uh, Beechcraft model C9, C90A, <laughs> if if that means something to you. Uh, and in the end, again, with, with more complete information, I can do a more complete analysis. And that was the point of all that, of all that enrichment. So we're going to try to create a map from scratch and we'll see how this goes. So this is Elastic Maps. Um, there's, as I mentioned, it's this multi-layer application. So you can add layers. And we have a bunch of different kinds of layers you can add. So you can upload GeoJSON directly. And that's super handy. If you have some of these files, you can just hit upload, put them in here. Uh, it'll automatically index it for you and, and let you display it on a map. Um, you can you can view individual documents, which as I mentioned in the past stuff, before we had built Elastic Maps, you couldn't see individual documents. You could only do aggregations. You could only do these clusters and grids and these heat maps. Uh, but now you can view these individual documents, which again is very powerful. We had those region maps, which again were called core pleth, and you can do those still in Elastic Maps. Tracks I'll show you are kind of cool and point-to-point -point pieces. This is really handy for network analysis when you're looking like uh, computer network analysis, you know, looking at source and destination points, who's talking to whom. Um, and then we can pull in external data from both our Elastic Maps service and any third-party services that are out there using either raster tiles or vector tiles. We do also have some pre-built layers for our, our solutions. But I'm going to start right now with a, I'm going to start at the highest level, actually, and do a heat map. And yeah, pardon these errors. This is from a failed machine learning job that I was aborted doing. I don't want to choose my airports. So I want to look at flights. Am I going to run to a bug here? I'm going to run to a bug here, aren't I? Yeah, this was hitting us before. Uh, we're also going to show you some alerting uh, that I didn't cover here yet. I was going to get to, but there's a, there's a, a bug in the, my current setup that I have that's limiting what indexes show. So I'm actually going to go to my existing map and walk through what we did on this thing. Because this is an existing map. Let me hide. Oh, get out of my way. 
controls. There we go. Uh, an existing map, here's all those layers I've added already. I, this was the heat map layer I was going to build so that we can see worldwide where my flights are. Um, you'll notice that if I zoom in far enough, this layer is going to hide itself. Almost. There we go. Um, because that's a simple configuration piece is that if you edit this layer, you'll see that I can configure its visibility at various zoom levels. So I hear when I get to zoom level six, it essentially hides it. And that's what I accomplished there. And when I zoom to that level, other layers turn on. And some of the layers you see are this last flight marker and the flight tracks. I showed you that flight tracks layer before. Um, and there's a lot of information I'm seeing on this map. So as I'm looking around here, uh, I, have a, I have these planes. You'll notice they're different sizes and different colors. And they're also pointing in different directions. And so all that is coming from the ability to style all these points on the map. So I have this little layer style piece. I decided to choose a icon that's called airport. I don't know why it's called airport because it looks like an airplane to me, but I could choose anything if I wanted like a camera. God knows why I'd want to pick a camera, but in the end I pick something that looks like an airplane. Um, but I'm coloring, it's, I'm making a color dynamic based on the velocity value. So as it's going faster, it's getting darker. And so by looking at the map immediately, you can get these little, the sense that these clusters of tiny little light colored aircraft are probably moving very slow. They're probably near airports. And in fact, they are, and we can zoom in and see that. Um, whereas these big ones are, are probably flying faster. They're darker. Um, I also didn't I set that orientation of that symbol using that true track information, which was also handy. I can see which way the thing is flying, of course. But then the symbol size itself is also reflective of a, of a dynamic styling measure, in this case, altitude. So the higher it is, the bigger it is, the lower it is, the smaller it is. Uh, so again, a ton of information just from here. I can see immediately which planes are high, which ones are fast, which ones are low, and which ones are slow, and what direction they're all going. Um, so that's a lot of dimensions of data uh, just at, at a single glance. And, and from a creating perspective, it's not very hard to create these things. I'm just picking what, what piece of that data I want to use. Um, if we wanted to change it by vertical rate, maybe, so that the ones that were accelerating upwards the fastest were the ones that were the biggest, or the ones that are yeah climbing the most would have the, the biggest size versus the ones that are descending, um, or whatever other feature of data I want to use. I think the altitude was a handy one. Um, so that's that particular layer. And you'll notice it's also last because I'm able to do some degree of collapsing of these things. I'll show you a different layer to show what I mean. So I'm going to hide this one. You'll notice, of course, this handy little panel to do some manipulation. If I hide that and turn on the all, you're going to get a lot more planes here. Because now, you know, that state information I was getting from Open Sky gives me a point every few seconds. Um, so for a given flight, I have a lot of data for that one flight, and I get it over time. So this is the probably the same aircraft, if I zoom in on this sucker. Um, and it's, it's kind of cool and all to see each point I get for it. But from a visualization side, obviously this is pretty messy. It's hard for me to make a lot of sense of it. So being able to show just the last instance of it is, is useful. And that's what I had done back here. So I'm gonna hide this sucker again, show this one again and show you how we did that. Because as I mentioned, we have this unique identifier for planes. So that gives me the ability to, to collapse them, to group them by that value. And that's here. So we can scale this, you know, there's a bunch of ways in a, in a big data world, how to, to control how you want to see all that data on a map, you know, from, from just a physics perspective, uh, showing way too much information on there is going to put a lot of load on the cluster, a lot of load on Kibana, a lot of load on your machine to try to render it all. So it usually makes sense to try to limit what you're seeing along some dimension. And that's where here I'm taking um, all, the, all those little records of airplanes, um, grouping them by that ICAO identity value and just showing the last one. And I could show the last two or last three or last 15 if I so desired, but I kind of like, I like the last one. It just makes it look prettier. Um, that's what I did here. I was going to show you this flight risk real quick because that was the, the, the squawk codes I talked about. And see if there's any, it looks like there's not any data on squawk codes today. Let's give me no data found, which may be good, right? That means there's no planes in distress. There's no uh, hijacking currently occurring. So I'll be satisfied with that. Uh, the last thing to show was that external data. So I did mention you can pull stuff in from other places. And I'm doing that here. There's data being hosted by NOAA. You can see what I'm talking about. They have a WMS service, which I link to. And if we show, you'll get a sense of some weather. All right, ta-da. <laughs> 
Uh, and the other one is around um, actual imagery we can show because there's another layer I found. You know, sometimes when you see an airport or some traffic, a, you know, a bunch of planes avoiding some area, you might want to see if there's mountains there, for example. So I actually can pull in a, an imagery layer from, I'm not even sure where this came from again. I, I forgot where I pulled this from. Yeah, I don't remember who National Map is. It's a government service. So from the government, there it is. USGS is where, is where this is coming from. Um, so the, it's just kind of like how Google Maps, you know, you, you're, or, uh, Google Earth, you're pulling in data from a bunch of places. You can do the same thing here. And it's just as simple as adding a layer, pasting in the URL uh, and saying save, and you can bring that sucker in. Um, the alert piece is the one thing we, uh, uh, that little bug I talked about in my environment is something I can't currently show. Uh, but the idea is you can set up a alert we have an alerting UI inside of, uh, inside of the stack management piece here where you can create an alert. You can choose a tracking containment alert where you define the index that has the, the shapes, oh, I'm sorry, higher, the index that has the points that you want to monitor. Here's that entity to say, what, what is the thing I'm trying to track? And then what index has the boundaries that I want to alert on? And they're really interesting. You know, you can set up a boundary and that's what I wanted to I put this on my map over here. This alert boundaries. I'll show you what this looks like. Let me hide you again. Zoom back out. Let's get rid of that. Hide. Um, I put a little box over my house because I thought that'd be a cool little alert. Where'd I go? There we go. Yeah, so this little box. Um, this little box is indexed. That's why I'm able to display it. It's an index field. And I can set up an alert such that when a plane enters that boundary, I can be notified. And when a plane leaves that boundary, I can be notified. Uh, and knowing when things are entering and leaving, you know, I can get a sense of, is something in my space? How long has it been there? Um, how long did it take before it entered in the first place from the last time I saw it? There's a lot of interesting um, intelligence-related questions you can ask when you can track things through space and through time. Um, so what I could have shown you is, is setting that up. So like this air, airplane in particular was gonna give me an alert as it entered my airspace. If I could put a microphone outside, you might hear that flying over my house right now. Uh, I don't have a microphone outside, so you can't hear it flying over my house right now. Um, but if I did, you could set up this action to do a number of different things. So when it triggered, I could get sent an email. I can send that information to some third party sites that we that we support, like IBM Resilient, Jira, et cetera, Slack, right? I can get a Slack message. Um, among the more powerful ones is the webhook because I can then trigger some kind of action as a result. You know, if I had um, a web service running to, I don't know, like to, to turn off or on my lights when an airplane arrived, right? I could, I could set up the webhook to, to trigger that action. And that means, you know, we can integrate with anything that's out there. If you can put a, a API in front of it, you can put a web service in front of it, you can trigger an action from it based on an alert you define inside of Kibana. Um, yeah, so super powerful. Uh, Interestingly too, this little index action, because once you start indexing the output of all these alerts, you can do some kind of meta analysis. Uh, maybe when you want to track, uh, you want to visualize when things, which, which part of the boundary a plane entered or exited from. And that'd be something you can do if you index that data back into Elasticsearch. So not just that it entered the containment field, but maybe I want to see where it entered, uh, which particular point. Uh, so that's the quick, quick-ish run through. That was about 25 minutes or so. Um, I, I left this little sucker open uh, for those who want to mess around. This is geojson.io. The cool part is it lets you draw directly on a map. That's how I built my little containment field. Um, yeah. So when you do this, it'll draw you, because this is just handy. You get the actual geojson for it. You can save that as geojson. You can upload it into Elastic Maps like I showed you through that, that geojson upload. Um, just really handy way to, to, to get some dynamic shapes. And for what it's worth, and, and uh, Thomas will cover this, we're adding this kind of capability into Elastic Maps as well. So with that, um, I am mostly done with my demonstration. So I'm gonna actually hand it back over, that's the wrong tab, back over to Thomas. Uh, thanks, Mike. Yes, I thought after this demo to talk a little bit about the ongoing um, work that we're doing in the Maps team and the Geo team at the Elasticsearch side um, to further develop uh, Geo in the stack. And um, uh, one thing that we're working on right now is this um, support for the Mapbox uh, vector tile format. 
So everything that um, Mike showed was actually just using GeoJSON sort of in the way that we fetch the data from uh, Elasticsearch because Elasticsearch returns um, GeoData as JSON. Um, uh, Elasticsearch in the future will support the MPT format and Kibana will consume it. Already we have support in Kibana maps to consume uh, vector tile services and there is a beta implementation of uh, Mapbox vector tile uh, format for Elasticsearch data. Um, but uh, we're planning to further develop this and push this actually down into the Elasticsearch uh, uh, database. So Elasticsearch itself will natively support the format. Um, and the goal really there is to, to more efficiently deliver um, data to a web application, such as Kibana, but your own or your mobile application. Um, another effort is um, Time Slider. So a lot of the data that um, our users work with, especially this sort of sensor data has a time component to it. Um, for example, the flight data or any kind of um, data of moving vehicles. Um, and a time slider basically will help uh, to, to step through that time. And it will, it will not just be about showing where a thing was in a given time slice. It, it will also basically any kind of data layer that you can add to um, uh, the maps will be governed by that. So if you have sort of an infographic on a dashboard that shows some uh, maps by country or by state, you could sort of use a time slider to do to, to comparisons from year to year or from month to month um, based on your metrics. Um, this probably will ro roll out in several phases. So um, the screenshot that you see animated here uh, is of a first version we're looking to release soon. And then this is the feature that um, uh, Mike uh, talked about. So right now, alerting is sort of separate from the Maps application in a sense. It's it is in Kibana. Um, so you go to the alerting UX of Kibana, and you can configure your geo alerts there. Um, but the next steps are bringing this this whole geo alerting work into the Kibana Maps application itself. And part of that are drawing tools so that a user on the fly can can generate. Uh, shape data, draw it, save it to Elasticsearch, and then um, from those generate uh, a containment alert. So what Mike had to do in two steps right now is draw that box around his house and then index it. Um, and for drawing that box, he used an outside tool. He'll be able to do that uh, right in um, Kibana. And so these are the, the, the three main features that we're working on as of today. Um, the first four slide is a little bit more general, I'll say. Um, and it's basically of how we see Geo and its role in, in all the products we develop at Elastic. Um, so we were looking at the Maps application for the demo, but the Maps application also, or at least sort of this idea of, of having an interactive map with data layers is embedded in many other um, products of uh, Elastic. And I highlighted a few there. So our SIM security application has interactive maps. Um, our uh, APM application has uh, maps to track uh, user um, engagement. Our uptime um, application has uh, maps that, that show you your uh, the health of your um, data centers, basically. And uh, our machine learning app too has a geo component to it that has um, embedded maps. Um, and so just we're planning to support that work. So all these different applications for different use cases that you might not necessarily associate with GIS or mapping uh, are supported in some way by the maps application or at least part of their uh, UX. Um, now they're also looking to further integrate with the stack. Um, uh, these are some larger scale efforts that Elastic that are very relevant. Um, one is the scheme on read. It's a big highlight on our website. So if you go to elastic.co, and one of the first things you read about 712 is that we G8 schema on read, which is this idea that um, you basically can generate uh, field values on the fly. So when Mike had to, to convert um, meters to feet to have something human readable, he was doing that with a pipeline, which basically before indexing the data, he made the decision, I want to be able to see this later on in my visualizations as uh, feet instead of meters. Uh, the scheme on read, an end user will not have to make that decision upfront. They will be able to just do that um, whenever they can think of it, but building a map and building a visualization. 
So we're looking for the maps application, not just the maps application, but uh, any sort of visualization tool in, in Kibana to, um, to support its functionality. Uh, more geo alerting, um, it's kind of a gen general one, but this is something that um, Kent mentioned at the beginning. So our geo alerts are, are containment based right now. So we detect when a moving vehicle is inside a thing or inside an area. Um, there are quite a few requests that we've had so far to do this more proximity based, like Kent mentioned, when the two things are close to each other, generate an alert. And then the last sort of larger scale topic um, that I wanted to highlight was this idea to building visualizations quickly. Um, when users are in Kibana and they want to see something and I get an answer to a question, they need to be able to do this very quickly. So that is all about tweaking the UX and making the flows very user friendly. And that is also an ongoing effort in our team. Um, and I think we're going into questions already. So I'll stop sharing here and that might take over again. Yeah, um, definitely send us or give us or, or hit us with any questions we have um, now. <laughs> yeah, in the in the meantime, I, I can it's like I can do more song and dance. I can show more stuff on the map if, if anybody wants to see anything else interesting. Um, but for for a little bit here, we are at your disposal. Yeah, I can just say that uh, I went through the Q and A. Um, and answered all of the questions that were happening uh, during your presentation, Mike. Uh, that was that was a great demo. Um, I, I referenced a number of Elasticsearch documentation uh, for geospatial queries or the spatial types like geopoints, geoshapes, etc. So if anyone here who's watching, you, know, you can click on Q and A and go in and look at the answered questions. Um, and of course, you know, for a lot of the questions, we do have very thorough documentation. Um, if you want to read about what's there, uh, one of the um, one of the people who posted a question, um, you know, they're all anonymous attendee. I don't know if it's the same person or if it's just all different people. It's fine. Um, mentioned that they're a, a Postgres and PostGIS user, uh, and they kind of wanted to understand, you know, what was supported. Um, so, you know, this would be a good topic, and I'm curious if more people are interested in sort of understanding and comparing you know, geospatial databases with Elasticsearch and its geospatial capabilities. So the question that came up previously was about uh, projection support and, and coordinate systems. Um, so where we store data in Elasticsearch right now it is in WGS84. And I posted a link to, you know, alternate ways in which you could store XY data and, uh, and provided an example. Uh, but we're really interested to know, you know, is this like a, a really important need and what are the other types of things that you might find in a traditional geospatial database uh, that folks are interested in? You know, Thomas alluded to in the slide deck that we're looking at uh, future development items that are sort of like the ST underscore spatial operators or predicates that you might find in a spatial database. I mean, we, we definitely want to support common, you know, spatial operations and you know, we have a good sense of what they are. But if people have feedback, uh, it would be great to hear what you what you think, and, and and if you have any description of your use case. I do see. Um, sorry. Yeah, there's a there's a question in the chat, uh, Faith. I don't know if that's what you were going to mention. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, I just saw yeah this one, and maybe um, you know Thomas, you can give your your two cents as well. The question from Glenn is about ML use cases and what we might envision, like estimating trajectory of an object. Uh, you know, to my knowledge, there aren't plans to do you know this kind of um, estimation or you know forecasting in a way. Um, but some of the recent work. Uh, again, maybe Thomas, you could speak to it because you, you work with the ML team. Uh, I'll just pass the mic to you, buddy. Uh, yeah, I can uh, talk a little bit about the existing geo support that ML has and then what they're working on right now. Um, so ML, most of, so the detections fall sort of in two buckets and, and the most relevant bucket for geo is, is what they call the anomaly detection um, tool that they've built. 
Um, and I said they actually actually say we, <laughs> um, it's just a separate team. Um, um, but it, it works for uh, time-based time series data. And the idea that in time series data, it will detect anomalies, say, so for example, a uh, spike in server usage is, is a big use case or, or sort of an unexpected um, uh, failure of a machine or something, like, or something like that. And that's what's detected with the ML tool, and that's kind of the common use case. Um, but they have a, a couple of um, ways that you can tweak that. And one, one of the ways um, that you can use the already in, in the existing product. Um, the, the anomaly detection tool is um, to do spatial detection. Um, so for example, say that you want to um, <clears throat> detect anomalies based on zip code or state or, or any kind of sort of area that, that your data is enriched with, uh, you can do that. Um, and um, it's basically a classifier. Um, and that just happens to be a spatial one. And um, what we're working on right now is actually mapping that. So already we have some mapping support in the uh, ML UX, and we're just building this out and sort of this mapping by state country is, is what's coming up next. Uh, another one there is, is more sort of this automated detection on, on spatial location. So imagine that you have um, buses or taxis driving around and they have very set trajectories uh, that are time-based. Um, if, if you have enough data, you can use the ML tool to, to detect um, when they're deviating for their trajectory for a given time. Um, but the time-based component is, is always very important there. Um, and so that is what the, the geo integration with uh, ML is right now. And, and the current effort with ML that we do is this more sort of enriching their UX to actually map these things. So you actually have a map in there to, to, um, to see it to see the anomalies where they are. To throw in also that um, even though we might not support that kind of ML to do um, estimating trajectories of objects, that's something that you can do with the data in Elasticsearch and save it back. So we do have, um, I'll paste this in the chat, a, this is for Python, if you're a Python type person, a, a project called Eland, which brings a lot of the, the data science E, the data science E Python projects uh, to bear on Elasticsearch so that instead of having to you know, if you try to do big data, if you will, I hate to use the term, but big data, Python-y stuff, um, you're having to pull all that information onto a machine uh, and you're limited by the res resources of that machine. But with Eland and with Elasticsearch, you can have all that work being done in the cluster itself. So you could create these more complex uh, models that you run against the data that's in Elasticsearch um, to, to build those kind of things. And, and the cool part is too, you can actually create models that you add into that ingestion processor so that as data comes in, it can run past your model. It can get that trajectory estimation and save that into that record. So now you have all that stuff indexed and, and visualizable. Visualizable? Visualizable. Yeah. That sounds like a word, I think. Yeah, another thing I wanted to say too is, yeah, I know in, in these kind of sessions when we talk a little bit about roadmap or you know demonstrate the latest a lot of the things we talk about are sort of bigger features, right? Like geospatial alerts and proximity alerts and you know, support for vector tiles directly in Elasticsearch to power more data, faster data, you know, as you use the mapping application. Um, you know, these are these are larger efforts. But also in you know the Kibana Maps application, we're making a number of you know sort of smaller usability changes as well. Um, you know, like in the layer list, you know. We recently added, and I know it's going to seem just you know so trivial, uh, but we added quick commands to fit to data and for toggling visibility. So you don't always have to go you know cursor to click into the menu and then menu down to show or hide a layer. You know you have these quick options, which is just you know sort of a standard experience. We've also added a layer name into the the title of a tooltip. So when you have multiple tooltips, you can reference where that content is coming from from which layer. You know we've uh, we now support um, spatial filtering with shapes and geo points. Uh, so up to uh, recent releases of Kibana, you could do spatial filtering, but only against geo shapes. Uh, but now we support points and shapes, so you can do filtering as you see fit in the coming releases. So there's a number of, of sort of smaller features that we're you know, we're working on. And again, I, I don't always want to hear like, oh, can you do this big project? Because big projects tend to take you know, maybe six months or 12 months, or they take time to really think through the architecture and 
uh, validate the quality of those kinds of projects. But if there are smaller uh, features or sort of usability workflows that people have while they're using uh, Kibana maps, or if there's just something missing in uh, Elasticsearch and it would just be easier instead of writing your own or whatever, um, you know, we really like to hear that because we, we are making uh, a lot of investment across geospatial in the stack. And it's just really a matter of prioritization, um, you know, for all the things. So uh, keep that in mind and feel free to just drop something in the chat um, if, you, if you want. Yeah, I don't know, Mike, if um, you know, folks, uh, folks aren't uh, asking any other questions through the Q&A, which is totally fine. Uh, but you know, did you want to show anything else um, on the Kibana side or, or reference any other material uh, that you think is worth sharing or that you commonly encounter? You know, Mike, as a solution architect, works with sort of a range of, of customers. Um, so I, I don't know if there's any sort of um, you know, here's some gotchas or FAQs or something that you wanted to share that often comes up. You know, one thing that came out recently is the Elastic Map Server. I don't know if you wanted to talk about, you know, that at all. Yeah, yeah, we can cover that piece. Um, maybe it's worth showing real something real quick then. So let me get back to my, open a couple tabs, come back here. tab. Um, yeah, so when we're looking at this, you're, we have a base layer. Um, that's the, the map itself, uh, that there's, if you get far enough in, you're getting roads and that kind of thing. And this base layer is coming to us from, um, from the Elastic Maps service. So this is EMS, the Elastic Maps service. And you can go today, if you go to maps.elastic.co, you'll see what that looks like once my internet does what I need to do. Uh, yeah, so you're seeing here's here's the service, and there's a bunch of different tiles that we we can give you. So of course there's a dark mode because who doesn't want some cool dark tiles, uh, but also all the world's administrative boundaries. And there's a lot of power in being able to 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 group and filter data by these different boundaries and these different layers. Um, but for those of our users who are on disconnected networks, which is pretty much all of my users, um, they don't have access to this service. They don't have access to anything on the internet. Um, so that's a problem that is. It's solved usually in a couple of ways. I mean, you know, getting getting tile servers in your network is not super hard. There's ones that are out there, and, and a lot of particularly on you know the, the defense side, there's a bunch of, of data suppliers um, that have uh, tile services that you can that you can hook into. But still, when you get started, you, know, you end up with with nothing. You get errors in Kibana. and so what we've done is create a, a package this whole thing up into a big container and give it to you that you can bring into your environment and called the Elastic Maps server. So actually, I think, I don't know if I have a link to it quick and easy. Uh, what am I looking for? Elastic Maps server. Because there's, of course, documentation on this thing of how to, how to hook it up. I don't know if that's the right one at the moment. Uh, yeah, how to serve tech locally. So there is documentation on here of how to, how to pull this off. You can download it directly from us. So you can do a Docker pull. Um, to, to get the sucker deployed. I said sucker again. I know Kent called that out. I'm not sure why it's stuck in my head now. Uh, uh, but you can download it, bring it into your environment. Uh, there is there is a second step at the moment to actually fetch all the tiles because there's a bunch of tiles. I think that it's in here somewhere that talks about doing the next step of downloading all those tiles and then moving that whole bundle into your environment. There's also a cool video. I don't have a link sitting right in front of me. Maybe someone can dig it up and share it that uh, a member of our team uh, Nick, who went through and, and was a, a member of building this capability, recorded a little YouTube video of showing how to, how to actually pull it off. Um, so I encourage you to look at that or come to here and look at this uh, if you have, if you find yourself on an internal network without internet access and still want all the handy features of the Elastic Map Service. And I'll draw this real quick is that um, although I mentioned that there's a lot of, of, of these tile services in these disconnected environments, a uh, common complaint is that they're slow. You know, they're, you're you're usually in an environment where you don't have a, a fat connection to that central service. So having something local that's fast for the just for, just for that base layer. You know, if you want somewhere to complex, um, the more the more enriched layers, if you want to put it that way, those more enriched layers, you might be willing to wait uh, on that slow bandwidth. But just for some of that base layer stuff, some of those those administrative regions, having something local and fast 
uh, is really handy. And that was a, a big ask from a lot of my customers.